Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the fourth semi-annual Model Train Forum Dinner. We have a fantastic speaker tonight and a short presentation right before that, an introduction, actually. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people come out. I think this is a fantastic restaurant. Uh, it's our first time here at the Village Green Family Restaurant. And uh, this may be just what the doctor ordered for our growing group. My name is Emil Hanault. My handle is The Big Crab Cake, uh, for those of you that know me from the forum. And before we get to our main speaker, who happens to be the educator for the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum, uh, we want to have a brief introduction of a new product by one of our famous uh, forum members for his modeling skills, and I think known really all around the hobby. Uh, so let me just give a five minute introduction to Harry Heineken. Have him show you his newest, his newest design. Really, really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Almost as in the house. This is an MTF ice cream stand. This became invented and designed and built under strange circumstances. And basically. Brian wanted to build this thing um, and started a controversy, and so I pretty much had to do it. And I, I had three, I presented three of my existing structures to him and said, which one of these do you think I could modify and make into a ice cream stand? And he liked this one the most. This actually was a boiler house, and uh, initially it was my product line. So it evolved. Um, first thing, the colors, then the sign, and then the ice cream cone on the roof, and then the little guy sticking his head in the ice cream cone. And then we got a full interior inside this thing, and the stuff out front, and the little graphics, then the decals, there was the great decal controversy. Um, the first set of decals came back to, from, there was wide as the building and didn't fit the sign at all. We had to get those changed. And uh, this is the final um, product of the evolution of the MTF ice cream stand. We, we've made a couple of them. A couple of them with modified um, logos for MTF. Um, they don't say OGR yet, but they do say MTF. And uh, they haven't seen them. And this is, what we, this is what we came up with. Of course, Brian wanted a Pepsi instead of a Coke logo, so I had to change that for him. And uh, he wanted two lights instead of one on the front, and I changed that. And then I put these little, I found these little things out at the Hobby Lobby, these little beads. And so I, I goosed it up with that to make it attractive, and the people seem to like that. So there it is. I present you the MTF ice cream stand. Well done, as always. We're lucky to have Harry among other master modelers in our group. Uh, one of the things that makes our group so special. Uh, and I, as I did mention before, I should have mentioned it right off the bat, Brian <coughs> Avails won't be here tonight, uh, but he is in great spirits. Can't wait to see uh, the video of this presentation, hear the stories from this uh, New York meet, and guarantees me he will be at the next one. Uh, and we're gonna make, we're gonna hold him to that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I notice when you meet each other, after you talk a little bit about the meets or the trains or what are you looking for, it frequently comes up, how did you get involved in this? And it's not always the same story. It's not always, my father bought me a train and stuck around a train, although it is frequently that, but that's not always the case. Um, there's a legacy of handing this down, this hobby, from generation to generation. And, uh, you know, Bill Webb's doing that now, I think they had a stay last night in the Red Caboose <laughs> Motel, which if any of you haven't heard, is around here, not too far away, a series of 20 cabooses or something, yeah, converted into a motel. Fantastic way to introduce young people, or not so young people, <laughs> into the idea of trains and our hobby. And that ties into some story that I was told uh, very recently by someone I just had the benefit of meeting, and you'll be meeting in a second. <laughs> Uh, and that is Pat Morrison, the educator from the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum. And when I talked to Pat, I asked, how did you get involved in this? 
And he said, well, he's from here. And his grandfather and his father used to take him to York meets way back to the beginning. Never missed one. And the result of that was he had very little interest in trains. <laughs> These things happen, he has best intentions of parents. Until his 12 year old son suggested that they put a train layout together. And I guess that sparked the fire. Uh, and it must have really lit a bonfire up because I'm not sure what he was doing before that, but he's now working for the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum. So I would say he's all in. And so are four generations of Morrisons. And that's just a great thing to see. So I'm really happy and, uh, that he's able to give us a nice, let's give a nice warm welcome. That's a wonderful thing to tell us that haven't been heard before about the future and the current status of the country. Thank you, Emil. Let me get this started here. Give me a moment. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank you for having me. Um, I've been at Railroad Museum now for in April, which we're still in April, uh, 21 years. So... Literally half my life I've been at this museum. And uh, I don't have a screen, so you're gonna have to bear with me on the, on the slides, but we'll do the best we can, certainly without them. Um, but I work at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, and the story that I have for you tonight, we're gonna talk about uh, the Railroad Museum. We're gonna talk about its history, and because you're a, a great group, and um, I'm excited to share with you some of the things that we're doing at the moment. So you're gonna get some uh, um, kind of where we're going as a railroad museum, a little bit of that. Uh, so I wanted to share with you a little bit of where we're, we're planning to move this uh, great museum's legacy, if you will, into the future. So I'm very excited to be able to share that with you. This is my home away from home. Of course, this is the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Our mission at Railroad Museum is to interpret, preserve, and collect um, artifacts related to the history of railroading in Pennsylvania. So now Pennsylvania has a pretty broad reach. Um, of course, it, at its peak, we had 11,500 miles of trackage crisscrossing across this state. Um, and still to this day, uh, more than almost 6,000 miles of track crisscrossing the state. So we've gone down a little bit in terms of track mileage, but it's still a very significant railroading state. Railroads, <coughs> excuse me, railroads were once, of course, a very important part of life in Pennsylvania. And as I mentioned, um, there was 11,500 miles of track crisscrossing the state. That was the third highest in the nation at one point. Here's a Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western train crew from about 1900. Pennsylvania's railroads provided jobs for people who worked as engineers, station agents, firemen, brakemen, track workers, and dozens of other roles. Now, this is an interesting statistic. In 1910, which is a little more than 100 years ago, one in five people living in the state of Pennsylvania worked for a railroad or a railroad-related industry. So you may not have worked for the railroad yourself, but maybe you worked for uh, Union Switch and Signal. Maybe you worked for uh, a manufacturer like Baldwin or Vulcan or uh, Porter or something like that. So perhaps you worked for a railroad-related industry. So it was a pretty big deal. Of course, they moved millions of tons of freight. They set standards for safety, comfort, and service long before things like the airlines or even a glint in anybody's eye. And of course, Pennsylvania not only had significant railroads, it also had um, many of those railroads built their own locomotives, but there were also significant manufacturing uh, centers within this state. So it was a very important, you know, we commonly refer to Pennsylvania by its nickname, the Keystone State, and that certainly plays true in terms of its relationship to the railroading industry and in terms of railroading in general. 
You probably recognize this, or perhaps you don't. This is Phoebe Snow. Phoebe Snow was a very clever marketing um, uh, idea or concept, if you will, around the turn of the last century. Uh, she wasn't necessarily a real person, although they had a real person personifying Phoebe Snow. Uh, they had some great marketing slogans based upon and around the concept of um, basically using anthracite coal as their primary uh, source of income, source of fuel, and so forth. And of course, her, her gown would stay white from morn till night on the road of anthracite. And so a lot of her slogans and a lot of the marketing uh, around this particular railroad went. This is the John Bull. Now, of course, at Railroad Museum, we have a replica of the John Bull that was built in 1940. Uh, the original John Bull was built in 1831. It was built in England, shipped to the United States, assembled here in the United States, and operated until, until about 1866 when it was retired. But boy, that was just the beginning of the John Bull's history. As you know and I know, it had quite a life of service in retirement uh, for a very, very long time. This is in 1893, the image that you see here is of the John Bull and its two coaches steaming all the way um, from the East Coast all the way out to Chicago for the uh, Columbian Exposition, which was the World's Fair in 1893. And then it steamed all the way back. Railroads served a variety of functions. During their heyday, of course, they hauled passengers and they hauled freight. But in many instances, when um, railroads would have the opportunity, they participated in things like railroad fairs, railroad expositions, world's fairs, and things of that nature. The story of Railroad Museum is intimately tied to the uh, 1939 and 40 World's Fair. Flushing Meadow, New York, of course, that World's Fair featured a lot of the equipment that's Pennsylvania Railroad that we have at our museum. So you see it today much in the same way you would have seen it at the 39 and 40 World's Fair. But of course, that equipment had served the railroads in revenue service for many, many years before it was a star attraction at the 39 and 40 World's Fair, particularly the second year of that fair. Railroads, of course, uh, the Eastern Railroads were heavily involved in this particular World's Fair. The Pennsylvania Railroad, as others did, provided direct service to the World's Fair. You'd go to Penn Station, then from Penn Station in New York, uh, you went all the way to the, um, which is a short ride of just a few minutes, uh, to the fairgrounds where you could enjoy the World's Fair. Much of our equipment had been long retired by the time of the 39 and 40 World's Fair. And in 1939, much of this equipment wasn't ready for that first year of the fair. The Pennsylvania Railroad scoured its rail lines looking for equipment to display at the World's Fair. Much of this equipment had been retired previously. These coaches and cars that were going to become a core part of the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum, or the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania's collection, um, had long since retired by the time of the 39 and 40 World's Fair. And it looked like this. Some of those engines and cars uh, were retired. Some of them were ready to be scrapped. Others had been repurposed as this particular baggage car was repurposed uh, to be used as a trackside shed. So a lot of the equipment that was displayed at that fair had long since been retired. And they did a marvelous job of restoring it to make it look as it did during its heyday. This is a, an H-class consolidation, the H3 1187. Uh, it was basically uh, retired by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1913, and it was sold to a quarry. And it worked in that quarry for about 25 years when the Pennsylvania Railroad came knocking again and reacquired the locomotive in an exchange for a B-class switching locomotive. So for the 1940 edition of the World's Fair, the locomotive is exactly as you see there, nicely restored as it did when it operated in the 1880s and the 1890s on the Pennsylvania Railroad. 
So again, they were really concerned at that time about marketing their image and presenting an image of certainly the best of the new equipment that had been operating, but also some of its vintage equipment. So they were apt and keen to show off some of the best of their heritage. And I'm glad they did for lots of reasons that I'll explain later. And of course, they had the opportunity to show off the best of their new uh, steam locomotives, like the S1 and so forth. They even had it on a treadmill here where they actually had it rolling in place to demonstrate the speed of their streamlined brand new locomotives that at that time were the state of the art. Here's 1187 on display at the 40 edition of the 39 and 40 World's Fair. And when you come to Railroad Museum, you see it a lot like this. So a lot of our displays and the way that our trains are displayed is very reminiscent of those grand uh, World's Fairs and expositions of a half a century earlier. This is the John Stevens, the original John Stevens was built in 1828. This is a steam wagon. Uh, steam locomotives were a relatively new concept and certainly um, the John Stevens that you see here was an experimental locomotive. Um, John Stevens was an inventor. He had worked with steamboats about the same time as a contemporary um, Robert's, I'm sorry, Robert Fulton was also working on steamboats and things of that nature using steam technology. And he built a track, a circle of track in his backyard in Hoboken, New Jersey, and tested this locomotive in 1828. And uh, not the best invention, not very successful, but the, the invention itself wasn't important. The importance was his drive to see a railroad come to fruition. And he certainly lit the spark and others followed in developing railroads and developing steam technology. Well, when they went to the World's Fair in 1939 and 40, the original John Stevens had already been uh, long since gone. They had built a replica uh, for the 100th anniversary of uh, Stevens Technical Institute, uh, which John Stevens' family started. And uh, the original replica had already been donated to a museum uh, the Chicago Museum of uh, Science and Industry. So when the Pennsylvania Railroad went to the World's Fair, they needed to build another one. So they built a replica of it. In 1940, the replica of the John Stevens that you see here uh, was displayed at the World's Fair. If you come to Railroad Museum, you will see this almost exactly the way it's displayed here. And one of the features of the World's Fair was a, a basically a parade of power, a pageant of locomotives in which they had a history of rail transportation, really a history of transportation in general, displayed in front of an amphitheater, displayed in front of an audience. They would push these locomotives in, they would push them back. And it was a pretty, a pretty grand procession of power all the way from the earliest horse-drawn rail cars to the most modern streamlined steam locomotives of the 1930s. Uh, this is a K4, uh, 3768. You see here paraded in front of an audience. Uh, the only one of the K4s that was streamlined exactly like this. Uh, this is another locomotive that was displayed at the World's Fair. However, it's not a Pennsylvania Railroad engine. Uh, it was built by the Heisler locomotive works and it was built um, basically to sell the concept of fireless locomotives. It was the only 080 and the biggest fireless locomotive ever built. One of a kind. There were other fireless locomotives built. We actually have another one. But this is the biggest and the only 080 fireless ever built. And it was streamlined the way that you see it uh, for just in time for the World's Fair. In 1948, 1949, there was the Chicago Railroad Fair, and much of our equipment at Railroad Museum was also featured uh, for a second time at the Chicago Railroad Fair in 1949 in particular. And a lot of our equipment was on display at that fair in a similar type of arrangement. In fact, they also had a, 
a locomotive pageant there. Uh, several of our pieces of equipment were featured in that railroad pageant. So um, we're grateful that we did. they did that because we, certainly without that preservation in those early years, we would not have them today. At the Chicago Railroad Fair, they displayed what was the world's fastest locomotive. Well, let me qualify that a little bit. In 1905 on the Pennsylvania Railroad, the original 7002, which was an E-class locomotive, uh, was considered the fastest locomotive in the world. Um, between um, a couple of towers, they timed it, they clocked it, about 127.1 miles an hour. It was basically the train that it was pulling was 20 minutes late, and to make up time, they added one of their newest engines to pull that train. And between those two towers that they clocked, they clocked it at about 127.1 miles an hour. Is it the fastest that a steam locomotive has ever gone? No. Um, but the Pennsylvania Railroad wanted to display its world's fastest locomotive at the 39 and 40 World's Fair. However, there was a problem. The original 7002 had been scrapped in 1934. So they didn't have the original speed holder uh, in existence anymore. So what did they do? They took another locomotive out of, um, out of service, another E-class locomotive. They backdated it to make it look like 7002 but it wasn't ready for the World's Fair in time um, to be able to display it fully. In fact, it wasn't even numbered 7002 when it eventually did show up at the very end of the 1940 World's Fair. But eventually, by 1949, it was all ready to go, and it looked as beautiful as it does today in our museum back then. <clears throat> but after the fairs, after these locomotives and rail cars had a second life as showpieces, they were basically retired permanently. First, actually in a couple of locations, first in a roundhouse and engine house um, in Trenton, New Jersey, and eventually in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, where all of them eventually ended up, um, certainly by the late 1950s, when many of these pieces had been permanently retired. On the Pennsylvania Railroad by 1957 and 1958, um, steam in service was a thing of the past. These pieces of rolling stock, these one-of-a-kind engines that had been saved for a variety of purposes, particularly the World's Fairs, had more or less been forgotten about in these uh, locations. And by the time that it ended up, all ended up in Northumberland, here's where it sits. And it sat there for a couple of decades uh, before anybody um, did anything with it. And I won't say that they didn't do anything with this stuff. Occasionally the John Bull, as you see here, and the coach that it would pull, the only surviving one of those two um, passenger coaches, would occasionally be taken to local fairs, uh, local town gatherings. So it did have some other roles uh, to play. In 1946, the John Bull and the coach behind it, the Camden and Amboy coach number three, uh, were featured in a Pennsylvania Railroad promotional film called Clear Track Ahead, um, in addition to some other uses that it saw outside of uh, its World's Fair role. And occasionally, the workers in the Northumberland Roundhouse would pull this stuff out make it look like it was steaming up even though that it wasn't. Um, clean it up a little bit to, to take some wonderful pictures of these locomotives while they were in their retirement years. But for the most part, this equipment was forgotten about. It was left to sit as the roundhouse around it started to rot away and deteriorate. So too did much of the equipment that was on display here. The roundhouse itself would eventually be no more but the equipment would have another chance at survival and being displayed for the public. It just so happened to make a very long story short, in 1964, the state of Pennsylvania had elected to build or wanted to build a railroad museum. There was a, an act of legislature passed. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania desired to 
build a railroad museum. Actually, it was a rail transportation museum at the time. It also included trolleys and other uh, forms of rail. Um, but eventually, that would all become just railroads by the end of the 60s. In 1965, there were several candidates for the location of a railroad museum officially owned by the state in Pennsylvania. Among them were places like Altoona, uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Reading, um, and various other locations, big and small. Well, we decided to build Railroad Museum in Strasburg. And at the time, it didn't seem like a very logical location to build a Railroad Museum. However, if you think about it from the perspective of there was already a very important Amish tourism uh, trade in Lancaster County, and we were right across the street from a tourist railroad that was a real railroad for many, many years that in the 1950s had started up again as a tourist railroad. And at the time was, and still is, the oldest still operable short line railroad in the United States, the Strasburg Railroad. The decision to put the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania right across the road from that uh, was a very wise one, a very smart one. So in 1968 and 1969, you had these strings of rail cars, locomotives, and other rail equipment brought down from Northumberland to Strasburg. We didn't have a, keep in mind, we didn't have a building yet. So this equipment would sit outside in many cases uh, for a number of years before a building was built. It's hard to see, but you can see the John Bull on a flat car. You can see the steam locomotives that would eventually become the core of our collection. They were part of the Pennsylvania Railroad historical collection at the time. And now they're just slowly being pushed into Strasburg, where they would sit outside for a few years until the Railroad Museum was built. There's the M1, our biggest Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotive, and certainly the biggest and longest Pennsylvania steam locomotive left in existence. Now, the Strasburg Railroad was doing quite well. Uh, in the early 1960s, they released some equipment by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was still the Pennsylvania Railroad at the time, including uh, 1223, uh, which is a, a 440 built in 1905, a D16SB. And that locomotive was leased to the Strasburg Railroad, and they ran it from about 1965 all the way until the very end of 1989 when they retired it. So it had a long life on the Strasburg Railroad in retirement. In addition to many of the coaches that you see, 7002 was leased to the uh, Strasburg Railroad while they were working on number 89 uh, in 1983. And they ran that locomotive until the end of 1989 as well. This is an early concept drawing for the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Now, keep in mind, in the late 60s, we didn't have a building yet. That was still a few years away. Ground was broken in 1972, and they were completed with the building in 1974. But at the time, we didn't have the staff to fully keep the place open, so we didn't open officially to the, to the public until April of 1975. Uh, the turntable that you see is an original Reading Company turntable built in 1928. Uh, Railroad Museum is the third location for that turntable. It was at West Cressona and it was at Bridgeport before it was moved to Strasburg. And that was the first big piece of railroad equipment installed at the Railroad Museum in 1970, before the Railroad Museum was even built. They built the tracks to the yard, started moving equipment into the yard in the early 70s. And then, as I said, in 1972, they broke ground on the Railroad Museum. Uh, the first edition of the Railroad Museum was under construction uh, by about 1973 and 1974. We were ready to start moving things into the building. And as I said, in April of 1975, we opened to the public for the first time. And in those first two years, we had about a quarter of a million people visiting the Railroad Museum at that time, in those two years. 
couple of other views of that building at the time. There's the John Bull, the Camden, or I'm sorry, the Cumberland Valley Combine car. Another view of the, of the building itself during its opening year. The Tahoe, which is a Baldwin product, 1875. This is the oldest locomotive that we own. I have to qualify that because the John Bull and the John Stevens are replicas. Uh, they were built in 1940, so they're technically not our oldest locomotives. And of course, the view of the, of the Rolling Stock Hall in the late 1970s. <clears throat> we had a few exhibits, but it was all very modest. We kept adding equipment and adding equipment to our collection. We added a Pullman car, the Lotus Club, a Western Maryland uh, business car, which is also a Pullman car. And we uh, gradually added other pieces to the collection as well, including this E7 uh, diesel locomotive, um, which was retired in 1973. And uh, the guys in the shops kind of stashed this away so that it wouldn't be scrapped. And uh, the state of Pennsylvania acquired it. And by 1976, we had this piece of, collect piece of equipment in our collection. But a lot of this equipment, unfortunately, we couldn't fit into the building. At the time, the building was only about the size of a football field indoors. So a lot of the equipment that we were amassing was sitting outside at that time. Uh, the Friends of the Railroad Museum was chartered in 1983, and that was important because they provided a lot of the fundraising ability uh, for the Railroad Museum to go out and raise money to help save the trains. So beginning in the early 80s, we now had the ability to go out and raise money uh, to support our operation, but also to restore the trains. Now, again, at that time, all of this work was done outside. It was weather dependent, and the stuff would still be rotting and rusting while they were working on this equipment. So it wasn't the best of circumstances, but it was, we were on the right track. In 1983, we were able to get the John Bull steaming again, so the John Bull replica, which had been operated at the World's Fair in 1940, and subsequent events, uh, was brought back to life in 1983, pulling uh, equipment around in our yard, among other things. And we actually, I will, take, I will tell you, this is the last steam locomotive in our collection that we ran under steam. We officially retired it from steam service in 2002, but it had gone to Vancouver, it had gone to Sacramento to steam, it had been in operation several times since it was brought back to life in 1983. In 1988, we added uh, Steinman Station, which is a recreation of a turn of the century passenger station, passenger depot. We started adding hands-on programs for kids including our very popular Working on the Railroad tour, which I have done probably a thousand times and could probably do that tour in my sleep. I enjoy it. Uh, it's a wonderful tour. It's a way to sort of bring um, hands-on activities to our school kids, but it's also a way to teach young people the jobs of railroading. And we also have interactive, I, you, you guys are all modelers, so we can't do this without model trains. It's certainly an important part of how we teach every generation how railroads did their job. We use the models. It's the best way to do it because we can actually, in small scale, teach about how railroads did their jobs. We actually have a couple of switching layouts. This is the earliest version of the High Iron Challenge. And when I started at Railroad Museum, this is one of those things that I got to work on every day. Uh, but something else was happening in the 1990s. In 1993, we got the go-ahead to start construction of an addition. In 1994, construction was well underway, as you see here in this image, for the addition to Rolling Stock Hall, which was completed in 19, and opened in 1995. So now we've literally doubled the interior space of Railroad Museum. And if you look at it from this perspective, but even better from this, this angle, from the inside. It's designed to look like a big city, turn of the century passenger train shed. 
So when I think of Broad Street Station <clears throat> and it's 16 tracks, when I think of Reading Terminal and it's 13 tracks, when I think of Grand Central Terminal, when it had that big grain, train shed, when I think of a, a, a big city passenger station from the late Victorian era, I see what Railroad Museum was designed to look like. We have six tracks, but imagine 16 tracks, um, something of that size. That's what we were going for. In 1999, we added a restoration shop. So now we have the ability to restore things indoors as opposed to just outdoors and in where the public is inside the building. And I'll show you some of the products of our restoration shop in just a moment here. Here's the first piece to go into the roll, to our restoration shop. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an 1890s era Russell snowplow. And uh, we had acquired this quite early in our history, um, but we didn't realize how bad that it was in terms of its dry rot, cubicle brown rot, until we actually started moving the thing around. It took us about seven and a half years, but we literally rebuilt it, and now you can actually see the way that it looks a product of our restoration volunteers and our restoration staff. Uh, our most recent freight car that was completely restored from the ground up is this um, h and t Huntington and Broadtop cabin car um, built originally for the Pennsylvania Railroad. It's a class ND uh, cabin car. And the last thing to roll out of our restoration shop completely restored is this E6 Atlantic number 460, commonly referred to in railroad circles as the Lindbergh engine. Okay, maybe you've heard of it. Um, in 1927, when Charles Lindbergh came back to the United States triumphant from his transatlantic voyage uh, by plane nonstop uh, from New York to Paris, um, he was given a medal and he was promoted to colonel uh, at the White House. Calvin Coolidge was the president at the time. And they filmed this as they did a lot of things for newsreel footage. And to get it into the theaters in time to be displayed for the public, uh, they did it sort of ceremoniously, to make a long story short. Uh, they hired, they hired um, the railroad, they hired a couple of air, airplane companies. Um, they even had a parachutist drop in um, the footage into New York City. Um, but the story goes, the, the railroad was actually able to beat the airlines in getting this footage into the theaters um, because they could actually process the film en route. They had a baggage car, they had a P-70 coach behind the locomotive. They actually had basically the mobile film processing lab on board and that's how they could get the film completed even though the planes technically beat them into the city, they were able to get the film footage into the theater quicker because it was already processed when it got there. Now, I wanna show you what we're working on at the moment. So this is about as close as I can tell you and give you to up to date. This is the Bethlehem Steel Fireless Locomotive, the Three Aces, 111. And what we've done is We've removed the asbestos so it no longer has the original asbestos insulation anymore. It's been completely removed, abated, and disposed of. What we've done instead is we've built a framework around it so that we can attach the, reattach the jacketing. There's actually more jacketing on it now than what the picture shows you. And then we'll repaint it and we'll put it on display. So we're, we're about a year away from completing this, uh, but this is the latest locomotive to go on our shop. So we're hoping very soon to be able to show you what it looks like. I will tell you that it wasn't painted black. Does anybody know what color it was painted? Anybody? Safety orange from the wheels up. We actually have a photo of it in service with the safety orange paint. We can actually peel away the layers of the paint and you can study them and you can see a literal history of a piece through its paint layers. You can see what it was painted at any point in its history. And we discovered a lot of orange paint underneath the black paint. Safety orange, yeah. The other thing that we're working on simultaneously is a few years ago we acquired a crossing tower or crossing shanty 
uh, from the Central of New Jersey Railroad, and this was in Wilkesbury. And uh, if you know where Stagmire Brewery is, close to that, okay, near the station, it was in proximity to that to that area. And uh, we're going to have to, because of the the brown rot, um, we're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding of this. But the pump looks great. It is an air-powered pump. It operates on about two or three pounds of air pressure um, to raise and lower the gate. So we're hoping to restore it to make it look really nice, to make it presentable. Um, and who knows what we'll do with it after that. Uh, but it'll be indoors. We're not going to put it up on the tower because the tower uh, is too far gone. Um, and we want to make sure that people can see it at level to look inside and see how wonderful it, it will look when it's finished. We've also acquired some things recently. In July of 2015, we acquired an AEM-7 uh, from Amtrak. We also acquired a TTX flat car, um, which was restored before it got here. So we actually got a piece that was already restored. So we can tell the story of intermodal transportation on the railroads as well as regular freight service. We also have a pretty important Library and Archives collection. We're hosting researchers all the time. We have lots of folks who enjoy, who want to know more, who want to measure our equipment to make models. And uh, we certainly have hosted many, many a researcher over the years. We have important photographs. We have important um, drawings. We have uh, important books. It's a very significant collection. Over 12,000 objects, big and small. So we don't just have locomotives and rolling stock. We have over 100 pieces of locomotives, rail cars, and the big stuff. But we also have a lot of small things too, like tools, dining car china, uh, uniforms, lanterns, you name it, we probably have it. And where I get to work every day, for the most part, because you are all into the model train end of things, so am I. I can't escape it. Uh, I work in Stewart Junction quite a bit of the time. Stewart Junction is our hands-on um, education center. We have operating model trains. We have a, a huge uh, switching, 110-foot long switching layout, which is all G-scale, and uh, has five different towns, five different switching layouts built into one huge train layout. We also offer summer camps and educational tours. Again, working on the railroad is still around. We've been doing that for more than 25 years. It's one of our most successful programs. We host special events, special exhibitions. We have a changing exhibits gallery that we change every year or every other year. I think this year it's going to be every other year at this point. We have a simulator of a GP38-2 diesel locomotive uh, that we, it's currently out of service, but it's going to be rebuilt as a part of one of the things I want to talk about tonight. Uh, we have a recreated town from 1915. As I said, in that year, in that era, uh, track mileage in the state of Pennsylvania reached its peak, and we want to be able to show what a typical small town in Pennsylvania looked like during the heyday of railroads. And you're perhaps familiar, if you're paying attention to uh, a lot of our news feed at Railroad Museum, we're hoping to build a roundhouse. It's taken us a little while to get the project off the ground. It's been a difficult project to plan and design and build, um, certainly. Uh, but we're really excited about it. It's another opportunity to get six of our pieces of rolling stock, six of our locomotives, under roof. Uh, so we're excited, hopefully, uh, to be starting that in the very near future. Um, I can't tell you when exactly, but it's going to be soon, I can tell you that. And the, the roundhouse itself was inspired by the turntable that we have in our collection, which was built in 1928, and it was inspired by the West Crisona roundhouse, uh, in which our turntable was prominently featured as a part of its operation. It's not going to look exactly like it. It's a, it's a modern museum building shaped like a roundhouse. But that will give us an opportunity to display pieces like 460 indoors. 
In addition to 460, we will also have our biggest locomotive that the Pennsylvania Railroad um, displays at Railroad Museum. Um, the biggest surviving Pennsylvania Railroad steamer, the M1B, uh, 6755, built in 1930. We'll have the B6SB, a switching locomotive, the L1, the K4, and the H10. So there will be six locomotives in that roundhouse. All but, one, all but two of those are outside right now. So this is a wonderful opportunity to get those other four locomotives into a building. We also have new exhibits coming uh, this next year. This time next year, we will have some brand new exhibits to show off to the public and um, new wayfinding, new signage, a lot of exciting things that I wish that I had pictures of to share you, but we haven't built them yet. So that is uh, some of the things that we have to come. So hopefully within a year, you might see the beginnings of a roundhouse, and you will hopefully see some new exhibits at Railroad Museum. So this is a really exciting time to be a part of Railroad Museum's history. So I will leave you with this image because I love it. It's one of our summer camps, and uh, our shop workers are working on some track, and they let the kids not certainly use the tools, but they let them watch as they laid that track and to give our kids an opportunity to see what real railroading looks like in action and um, it's a good chance for them to get a good group shot there. I'm in there somewhere but I want to thank you and this is a, a shot a parting shot that I will leave for you this is Railroad Museum at night and uh, it's a wonderful place I hope you have an opportunity to visit I actually do have some brochures with me if you'd like to take one with you and I will happily stick around if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. It's fantastic to see that the model rail, that the uh, <clears throat> railroad museum is not only thriving but but growing. And there's going to be new things to see right very soon. So, if you haven't been, you have to go. It's nearby. We're here twice a year in New York, and it's so close that uh, it's almost ridiculous not to stop by. There's amazing the volume of things they have, and it's just so well presented. We really want to thank you for coming out today. Sure, my pleasure. And Anytime. You know, time. And it's fantastic. Thank you. Any questions? Do you have or do you have plans to have a restored GG one? Yes. Well, we have two, as you know. Um, we have 4935, which was one of the last to be built in 1943, and we have old rivets, uh, the prototype 4800, which is outside. Um, that one eventually we do hope to restore. Uh, like a lot of things, as you can imagine, it all takes time and it takes a lot of money. Um, but we do have high hopes for that one. We do hope to restore that one um, and to get it looking in good shape as it did when it was new, all rivets and all. Uh, so yes, uh, we actually, we will never, they will probably never ever run again uh, for lots of reasons, um, but they will certainly look good and uh, last for many years to come. Good question. What is a fireless locomotive? A fireless locomotive is a locomotive that doesn't have its own fire, doesn't have a firebox. Uh, they basically fill maybe two thirds of it with hot water and they pump steam in uh, from outside to superheat it, supercharge it, and it can run for several hours off that charge. The average one, maybe two to three hours. The biggest one that we have could run for about, I believe about six hours off that charge of outside steam. Now, they were great in a place like a, a power plant where you had an outside steam source nearby. Um, they were great for switching, very high pressure. Um, very powerful little engines for what they were, um, but that's basically what a fireless locomotive is. It's a good question. We actually have two of them at Railroad Museum. So not a rotor. What's that? Not a rotor. No, they were they were great for for light duty switching in the yards and in, in plants. What was the pressure on that then? If you had to pump it in. Yeah, I think they were. I think the one that we have ran on about 350 pounds of pressure. I want to say somewhere the three to 350 pounds of pressure range. They were a little higher than your average steam locomotive in that sense. Yes? Yes. Um, do you plan to steam up any of the steamers? We get asked that a lot. Um, and, and to take them out maybe 
Sure. How many, can you get to the Strasburg tracks to so get out there if you wanted to? I, we don't have any plans, certainly, certainly at the moment, to steam up anything. Um, we do connect, our tracks do connect with the Strasburg Railroad. We have a, a switch, uh, they cross the road, and literally you ride into their property shortly after that. Um, we don't have any plans at the moment to do that. Certainly, it's very cost prohibitive. Um, so, whereas it might cost us a considerable money just to restore it cosmetically, to restore it to running condition is quadruple that. So, uh, to answer your question, no, we don't have any plans to steam anything, unfortunately. Yes? Wasn't the clock on the face of the building, didn't that come from the Broad Street Station? You are correct. Yes, it came from Broad Street Station. Uh, we added the clock uh, to the original building uh, later on, and then when we added the new addition to the building, or the new uh, front entrance to the building in 2007, it was relocated to that clock tower that you see there. So yes, uh, it was recently restored uh, to be added to the front entrance, the new front entrance. Yeah. It was released, really ballpark figure of what actually a redo on a Okay, well, to cosmetically restore it, to make it look good, looking at about four to 500,000. To get it steam worthy again, uh, quadruple that. Probably about $2 million on average. Back then, I don't think it was two million, certainly. But, uh, you know, I would say in the 500,000 to a million range, certainly, probably. Quite expensive. Um, Part of the problem is you're dealing with something that's a very dangerous, pressurized vessel with a lot of moving parts. And uh, they were quite expensive even then. Um, but yeah, good question. And really what it comes down to with us, it's not just a cost factor, is that when you restore a locomotive to running condition, a lot of the original parts are no longer usable. So we have to replace a lot of the original fabric, the original material of a locomotive to get it running to steamworthiness again. And that you're, you're losing a part of its history uh, as a result. So what we try to do is we try to save as much of that original metal, that original steel that we can. And uh, so cosmetically restoring a locomotive is, is in our case far preferable uh, to getting them steaming, steamworthy again. Good questions. Okay. Well, I thank you. Have a wonderful evening and come see us. All right, everybody, we're meeting tomorrow for those of you that can in the Orange Hall at noon for our regular group picture. And uh, we're come late and we'll Photoshop you in like we have done on the <laughs> No, we're not. So if you see anybody with a red tag, grab them and bring them in. Uh, and we'll be there. We'll meet everybody tomorrow at noon if you can make it. Uh, thanks again, Pat. Thank Fantastic you. Fantastic presentation. Glad you enjoyed it. Good night, everybody. Good night.